Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Talia Beach, and I work for Canada or the Canadian Special Operation Forces Command. Um, I'm stationed in Ottawa, and like my two colleagues, Francois and Ramsey, we're all defense scientists, and we work for an organization called uh, <coughs> Defense Research and Development Canada, the Center for Operational Research, but we're stationed in with a command. Um, and that's CANSOFCOM, is the acronym for the Canadian uh, Special Operations Forces Command. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about a study that we've been doing over the last year, um, together with my two colleagues, as well as many other military operators. And I will try to be on time. So just if anybody's interested in where I come from and what my organization looks like, it's a uh, cross-country organization for us. We also have teams embedded at NORAD in Colorado. Um, and we have different postings that we can do in different parts of the world, like Adelaide, for example, um, in Davenport in New Zealand, as well as overseas in Europe. Portsmouth, Brussels, whatever you really want to do, you can pretty much go anywhere you want to, as long as it's a NATO post, or you can go to some related defense science and technology laboratory. Um, so we primarily work for the three regular forces, that's Army, Air Force, and our Navy. Um, the Special Operations Forces Command for us in Canada is a separate command from the regular forces. So that's a lot of the reason for that is because we need to be a quick response. So our Special Operations Forces are called in for um, different types of events, like maybe a sensitive site exploitation event, or we might have a hostage scenario, and we need to be able to respond quite quickly. So we kind of have this like lateral command where we um, operate from. So Kantoff.com itself has about 2,200 people within it, and those are operators. We have three scientists to serve that group of people. Um, and beneath our headquarters, we have three units, well, four units, but three primary units that we'll be talking about today, and that's our DTF-2 unit. So this is our quick response unit for things like hostage rescue. Um, then we have our CGIRU unit, so this is in cases where we might have some strange chemical or biological threat um, come into play, and we need some quick response with that. And then we have our CSOAR regiment, and that regiment is um, primarily involved with different air or airfield seizures, or if we need to go into an area and be able to um, deploy resources, we need to have CSOR involved to get us there so we can safely um, settle down. So our organization, or the command itself, is 12 years old, um, and we're led by a two-star major general. Um, and our units are primarily across the Ontario province, so I don't know how familiar everybody is with Canadian geography, so I just put up a little map for you to see. But we're in Ontario, um, and most of our units, including the headquarters, are within Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. And we also have some units deployed a little bit further out, but most everything is in um, southwestern Ontario. So the study we're going to be talking about today is really a forward future looking study and the requirement for us to be ahead of our adversaries at all time is really the reason why we're having a study like this. Um, <clears throat> it's really been a three part study and we're working in concert with our other uh, four eyes or five eyes partners is what we call it, but that's our Australian partners, New Zealand partners, the US and the UK and we try to line ourselves up so that we're all collaborating effectively and contributing together and uh, working forward in concert to really ensure that we understand what our future threats are, um, what kind of capabilities we have right now and what we'll need for the future. Um, and I guess the overall objective of the study that we've taken part in is to really set ourselves up for a way to make constructive institu institutional change in the future um, knowing what some of these likely threats are. Sorry, I'm making like a really strange floor noise. <laughs> okay, so the approach we use is really similar to a stratified survey. Um, and this has been really interesting for me. It's the first time I've worked with survey data since I took like a small survey course in university. So it's been really interesting. Um, 
what we did is we tried to gather as many expert opinions as we could over the different units that we have within Cansofcom. And we were able to um, obtain, I guess, close to 15 different participants across the units, which I realize isn't a very big number, but it's really hard to um, take operators time because they're very busy training for you know, really important events that are probably more important than a scientific survey. Um, even though our two-star general was the one that is making us do it, um, it's still hard to pull people away from their everyday responsibilities to do so. Um, so what we did is we looked at actually a few different missions across the different units, um, but in order to be able to give this talk today, I had to simulate data um, so that I could just show you what we had done and uh, give you an idea of how we structured the survey and how we set up respon responses. Um, so we really looked at our three different units that we had. We looked at different missions within those units. Here I'm just showing three different missions. And then you can just read the description of each of the missions, which is I think pretty standard across most of the NATO countries, um, as well as our Five Eyes partners. So I just wanted to note again that we did use notional data here. So it is made up data, I've simulated some data, and the word clouds and everything that I'm gonna show you is just the idea of it. We're really thinking about the method. And ultimately at the end of this talk, what I'd really like to have is some constructive feedback from people. If you can think of different ways you'd like to do it, then I would welcome those thoughts. So I guess we'll get right into the survey now and how we set up the survey is we gave our participants a way to sort of think of um, the different uh, paths that they would take when they're employing in an event. So we look across a targeting cycle. So this is a standard cycle that people use in the Special Operations Forces Command on an international basis, not just for us. Um, so there's seven main phases. The first phase is the shape phase. So this is the phase where you go in and you start thinking about what your theater picture looks like, um, maybe a description of the environment, and trying to understand like what the culture is like and what basic people will be doing there and what kind of like their everyday functions are like. Uh, then we look at the find phase and that's where we identify and try to localize where that target might be so that we can get ourselves a starting point to get the target, understand what that target is doing and we can begin thinking about gathering some intelligence. The third step that we have is looking at the fix component and it's, actually an application of what you've gathered to try to assess and develop what kind of operational triggers you will have so that you can actually pin down where your target is in both time and space. Then we have our finish phase. So this is often where we'll use an application of force to um, try to pin down that threat. And it could be lethal or non-lethal. Obviously we prefer to do non-lethal if we can because we're Canadians and that's what we do. Um, and then our next step would be exploit. So this is where we really look at where we've picked the target from, the process of examining, interrogating, trying to learn more information and gather intelligence about what has been going on. Then we can look to the analyze phase um, where we try to really understand what all these things mean and look at the evidence and try to make some kind of meaningful inference about what that is. And then we disseminate that product um, for our agencies across our country as well as our NATO partners and the other Five Eyes partner groups. Uh, so we looked at four basic measures of effectiveness or measures of capability. We actually had a fifth one in but it seemed to be less similar to the others so we pulled it out at the end of the day and we really focused on these four. So effectiveness, capacity, agility, and resiliency. And we asked each one of our participants to evaluate what those measures would be um, in each of the, s the different phases of the targeting cycle that I just presented to you. Um, so we also had participants look at the phases in terms of how they are at assessing a fa the phase as a whole. So an overall assessment of what they'd done but we also broke it down for participants into smaller force elements so that they could really think about the different things that they needed to use in order to achieve their objectives. Um, and then we had this sort of a system that we worked out which sort of stands like a Likert scoring system where we identified uh, a different scale which had different meaning to it for each of the different measures of effectiveness. Um, so we were lucky in that we were able to start thinking about what we needed to do for the survey ahead of time 
and generate the data that we needed, which actually was quite beneficial for us because, I mean, ideally that's what we all want to do as data scientists is be able to create your own data. So I feel pretty fortunate for that. Um, and then what we did is we looked at where our participants felt like we were in capability at the present time and where we might be in the future, like in a 10 to 15 year time frame, based on a future operating environment picture that we had given them. So this is what the Likert scoring plot looked like. Um, we had six levels of scoring, which was not up to me, because I feel like Likert scoring should always be in odd numbers, and it makes me itchy still even to look at it now. Um, so we had our num six different levels from zero to five, and you can read the descriptions there if you like to. Um, essentially what our middle value was, was sitting between two and three where you're completing the mission. And sometimes you might complete your mission with a small amount of difficulty or see minor delays or have some kind of capability degradation that you would have to endure and move forward with in the future. So next I'm just gonna show you quickly um, what our data looked like this is just sort of like a subset, a chunk of what the data was like, but essentially what it was, it was a series of different columns for each of the force elements that were evaluated. Um, and we also took into account people's comments. So every time somebody evaluated a force element, you would have a comment usually associated with that. And especially we wanted to look at cases where some people would vote zero and some people would vote five and understand where that conflict was and why we had such extreme responses. And that actually became one of the most important things for us. So for each person in each unit across our command, this is what we did for those 15 participants. And it actually took much longer than you would think. It was about a week long process for each one of our units to go through the scenarios because we had to be very um, <clears throat> concise in what the scenario was so we could have similarities across the entire survey. So my next slide is a bit of a joke. <laughs> so we didn't have any missing data because if your two-star general is telling you, you need to do this, <laughs> you're best to not say, I don't know or I don't want to even guess. So I guess there's probably some limitations with that as well where some people may not be experts in a force element that they were looking at, but they had to guess anyway. Although I feel because they're so close, in that kind of a situation that you would be in in any of those missions that I think you would have a pretty good idea of uh, what the appropriate response would be. So we had a series of assumptions and limitations as well as bias that we wanted to define and make sure that we all understood when we were moving forward to look at some of our analysis. And I think one of the biggest things that really became apparent as we were doing the survey is we were having these independence violations where some of the junior operators would put up their card and you know have a four up and then they'd look over next door to see what the senior officer had and then they would change their card quickly so they were all in agreement because that's what military operators sometimes have to do. Um, so we tried to um, mitigate that just by having all the junior guys sit up front and we wouldn't let anyone show cards and because we're scientists and not military it's easy for us to yell at people. Um, and I guess the other big bias that we had with our survey was that we looked at some force elements more than others because across different missions, for example, you would have an intelligence team across all your missions, but you may not use like a canine unit across all those missions. So the canine units weren't evaluated as, as often as your intelligence would be. So then we move here into some of the real analysis, which is why I know everybody is here. Um, what we did is we wanted to be able to understand not only from our ordinal data, what kind of differences we were seeing from now into the future, but also understand a little bit of the comments and what people were saying and taking into account because we were seeing that a lot of themes were really quite frequent and they were coming up in, um, a pretty significant way during different conversations that we had and I felt like the word cloud was a good way for us to just have like a nice picture for each of our units as well as across our whole command so they could see what some of those issues were and there were just from the word cloud alone you could really identify what some people felt were major issues for our command which I thought was quite nice. So the word cloud was generated using the word cloud or using the word cloud package, but there was obviously some pre-processing that had to be done prior to making a word cloud. And for that, I used the TM package, which like the speaker, I think uh, Anisha 
had also talked about that earlier in her brief. It is super easy to use, totally intuitive. I copied someone else's code off the internet. I modified it to, for my own purposes. I was able to remove punctuation, remove um, uppercase letters. I could build a list of stop words because military often, like sometimes, will swear. And so we can't have a lot of swears in our word cloud, so I had to take out a lot of the wording that they were using. But I found the TM package was amazing. Like, it was so easy to use. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and then I also used the Snowball C package, which is like a, stem, like a word stemming package. So it allows you to combine all the words that have different... Um, um, all the words that have different endings or beginnings, it will let you put that word together so you'll have representation of that in the cloud. So this is what our word cloud looked, out, looked like in the notional data anyway. So this is like a pretend word cloud. It doesn't really mean anything, but I just wanted to show you that this is what we had done. And you can see that some of the bigger words that come up and they're more frequent will be larger. You can also um, manipulate the color package if you want to have it look differently. And it was really amazing for us. So if we get into some of the Likert scoring and the data visualization that we did with the scoring, um, I used the Likert package. I don't know if anyone else has used that before, but it can be very stubborn and difficult, and I don't know if I would use it again. Um, so what we did is we looked at the different scores that we had for all of our force elements across all the individuals that had participated. And we set up our plots so that we could have present and then future, so we could make comparisons between the two just visually at first to see if we needed to do something further. Um, and it also was a good way for us to not have to look at means or medians because that made me uncomfortable and it still makes me itchy. I tried to move forward with using means and medians for this study and it's just it's a horrible thing because you're getting an average value of three even though you have these extreme votes at five and extreme votes at zero. So I'm quickly just going to go through these plots because I can see I'm running out of time. Um, so what we see is across your left side here, we have the rows which are showing results for force elements. Um, then you have a Likert definition at the bottom, so you can set that up so you can see what exactly the different colors mean. And this was actually pretty easy to set up the color palette for Likert. Um, I also used a centered equals true uh, statement in the Likert plot argument so that it was easier to see where those votes were going. Um, and then at the, at the um, left and right margins of the Likert plot, you're able to have a percentage so you can see how many people um, thought it was really terrible and you couldn't complete your mission and how many people really enjoyed it. Um, and then the color-coded responses, they all add up to 100 for each FE, so that's actually done intrinsically in the Likert package. So you can see for the results that we had for some of our missions, it's fairly easy to tell when those results are very extreme from present to future, but in some cases like this, it's harder to tell just by looking, but you can see that now in the present, it felt like they were, most of our force elements anyway, were, um, we're more capable to, capable to use those to complete the mission than we would be in the future. As you can see, there's more of those uh, hotter danger colors. Um, then we looked at this for each of the missions, and for a lot of our results that we had, our plots looked like this. So it was really easy to tell where we were seeing a lot of those force elements that could be um, not doing so well in the future based on the situation that we gave them. So we had these series of plots, and that made it, I think, pretty reasonable for us to see without doing too much future analysis. Um, <clears throat> We did get a lot of the common themes by looking at the different word clouds that we had. And some of those themes revolved around things like policy and the Canadian government. We have a lot of policy bureaucratic stop orders and that can be a serious issue, which is nice for our command because we're sort of to the lateral side of our regular forces. Um, technology and innovation I think is gonna be a big thing for us in the future as it will be for most defense organizations and um, some processing. So lessons learned, for me, the Likert package isn't really my jam. I would rather just go forward and do all the actual analytical stuff myself, build my own plots using ggplot, which is actually what I ended up doing. 
um, for our real data, it was really easy just to make those stacked bar plots and ggplot. You had complete control over everything, and I like that. Um, and just in summary, this was our first formal pan command um, capability gap assessment, and it went reasonably well. I think we got a lot of good information. There's quite a few things I think that we could do differently next time. For example, have more participants. Um, think a little bit more about survey design. And there's also some other things we could do to identify force elements that could be more, um, we could be at disadvantage of the future by using something like clustering. So I think that's definitely a way for us to go in the future in our next round of analysis. These are just the packages I use in any questions quickly.